I'd like to welcome everyone to our final day of training. Um, today, we're going to have uh, Drasmus give us a uh, uh, great talk here on multi-physics modeling. Um, is it precise? Is that how you use exactly it? precise coupling library? Um, and this is a, a great session that's going to tell us, I think, how to link OpenFOAM with other uh, applications out there, um, and I assume for multi-physics modeling purposes and multi-domain modeling. So something that we're all moving towards in an exponential rate, it seems. So without any uh, further talking, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And hello from Munich. We are in the OpenFOAM workshop, and we have seen already many approaches to multi-physics that uh, usually are inside OpenFOAM. But if you are here, you may have good reasons that you want to couple uh, OpenFOAM with other solvers, for example, DL2 or Calculix, or even two different OpenFOAM solvers. And you may want to do this in a numerically and computationally efficient way. My name is Gerasmus Kurdakis, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the Technical University of Munich. And today, I also have with me my colleague, Benjamin Neukermann, who should now uh, wave in the, in the <laughs> video. Hello. And uh, he may jump in uh, at specific points. On a few organizational notes, first of all, uh, this is a training session, but it will be quite dense. You are not expected to try things live. Uh, but please pay attention and ask questions in the chat. At specific points, uh, we will bring several of these questions in, in the session and uh, everything uh, is available on GitHub, also the slides and the software. And I would uh, very much like that this session is being recorded. Then let's jump into it. The big picture of precise. In Partitioned multi-physics that we are doing here, we often have uh, different solvers for the different domains. For example, we may have open foam as a fluid solver and DL2 as a structural solver. To couple these two solvers, uh, we don't think anything else than to call the precise library, which is a few additional lines of code. To make our life easier, we can uh, collect all these changes in what we call adapters and we distribute several of these adapters uh, to make your life easier. A good thing of this approach is that uh, even if you don't find an adapter, you can very easily couple your own in-house solver. And if a commercial solver has a good API, we can also couple this as well. We provide adapters for open phone that I would like to discuss in detail today. As you too, there is a third party example for foam extent. For structure solvers, uh, we have many tutorials for Calculix, and we are lately experimenting a lot with Phoenix, DL2, and Nutils. If you want to write your own adapter, Precise is written in C and has uh, API in it, but all the major scientific computing languages are supported. Now, let's zoom into this green box in the middle which is the library. It's uh, one thing that every solver loads and takes care of making the two solvers or more solvers communicate. And this is done efficiently through uh, TCP sockets or MPI. It takes care that uh, data is mapped between different meshes. This is particularly important as you may have a very fine grid in your fluid solver while you still have a very coarse grid in your structure solver. As a coupling library, of course, it has coupling schemes and it has a variety of them that you can choose at runtime. You can easily switch from an explicit to an implicit coupling, and I will come to these terms later. They are different than what they are used in the open form community. And uh, we also have very uh, advanced acceleration methods to make the iterations between the two solvers as few as possible. A feature that is coming up soon is also time interpolation, but this is out of scope for now. This tutorial will mainly have three levels. In the beginning, we will get our hands a bit dirty and need to remember a bit of Python. This will only be so that we can use the precise library in two simple Python solvers. And this is only so that 
uh, you understand what is happening under the hood. Hopefully you don't need to program to couple your open foam code or most of uh, the open foam solvers out there with other solvers. And in the beginning, we will focus in level two uh, on the open foam adapter itself, how you can use it, how you can configure it. Then we will briefly talk about uh, how to do a fluid structure interaction, coupling open foam and DL2. So in the first level, we will program, but in the second and third level, we will mainly use components that are already available in Precise. Let's jump into the first level. We will need for this recipe, Precise version two, which uh, was released in February and brings many uh, good updates. And it's easy to install it, for example, using binary packages for Ubuntu. Only for this example, we will need Python 3, and the Python packages NumPy and Matplotlib, as well as uh, the precise Python bindings. These are very easy to get, especially if you have a recent uh, version of pip, by just doing pip3 install user precise. Now, let's uh, look into our first example. We thought uh, we could bring something uh, easy that everybody can relate to and does not need much explanation. Therefore, we thought of this uh, generator and propagator example. Here we have two Python scripts and the first one here generator the uh, right boundary of the domain essentially is a 1D solver that is completely dummy as it only generates random data on its nodes. In the square on the left, we have a propagator, which uh, simply does a convection diffusion of a completely arbitrary um, scheme. What it does is that it applies a, a five point stencil and propagates values from its uh, right boundary towards the rest of the domain. Now, in this example, we will talk about the simp simplest coupling possible. This will be a unidirectional coupling. Uh, there will be no feed, the, the generator will be passing values to the propagator, but there will be no feedback from the propagator to the generator. Therefore, the generator will just be able to continue. There will be no more uh, synchronization than that and no more uh, iterations for convergence. Let's briefly look into the scripts. You can see that they are very, very short. So the first one fits in one slide. What do we do? We import NumPy and then we generate a mesh of 20 points. We define a time step size, in this case 0.01. And then we repeat until time 0.1. Uh, we generate some random values for u, and we increase the time. You can find this, uh, uh, these scripts together with the slides on this repository. Then we have the propagator, which is obviously a bit more uh, elaborate. We have now a 2D solver, so we define uh, x and y coordinates. Again, a 20 by 20 domain in this case. And uh, we initialize our solution with zeros. We set the time and the time step, and uh, we set some arbitrary boundary condition. So what we get on the right side is essentially constant in the uncoupled case. Then again, until time 0.2 this time, uh, we uh, apply a five point stencil. And we don't need to go into the details on how this works because this is, of course, completely unphysical. Now, please excuse this uh, technical glitch that I cannot uh, resolve completely. So let's see how we can uh, run these codes. We just do Python 3 and we run two solvers and they simply run. Just run them one after the other. They don't interact at all. The one reports, I'm generating data. The other is reporting, I'm propagating data. 
And this is uh, what we would see then in the propagator case. On the right, we get some constant essentially boundary condition, which we propagate. Not very interesting. Let's uh, make the two solvers now talk to each other. We need to call uh, methods of the precise API. All of these are documented in our documentation, but let's now look at the a small set and of the basic instructions we need to, to add. First of all, you see that I have uh, left uh, some space after importing NumPy, and this is because we need to import precise, and in particular, the precise Python bindings. Then, we have uh, already defined the mesh of our solver, and then we need to configure precise. What do we have here? We have the name of the participant. Remember, we have two participants. The one is called generator, the other is called propagator. These names, together with many other options, are uh, defined in the precise configuration file, which is an XML file called precise-config.xml. Precise is by default um, interesting and useful for parallel simulations. Therefore, it expects in its constructor the MPI communicator size and uh, the current rank. Here, we can simply set these values to 0 and 1 as we have a serial simulation. Then, after configuring, um, after creating and configuring precise, which happens in one step in precise version 2, we need to uh, define the coupling mesh. We have already uh, defined the mesh in the configuration file, which we call generator mesh. And to make our life easier, we don't work with uh, names, but with IDs, some integers that stay the same through the simulation. Therefore, we ask for the mesh ID of generator mesh from precise, that is called interface. Then we need to actually define the coupling mesh on uh, the boundary of our domain, which is uh, the, the same nodes that we are using. Then, uh, after we set the mesh vertices for this mesh, it's time to initialize and finalize precise. In the initialization, the two participants find each other and exchange some first information. And in the finalize, all the communication channels are destroyed. Let me mention here that uh, precise is completely uh, parallel and peer-to-peer. -peer. So every process of every solver would normally need to establish communication channels with the respective process of the other participant. Now, after we initialize and finalize, we also want to do something in every time step. So after every solution time step that we have in our uh, transient loop, we want to also advance the coupling for this time step. This method expects the time step size as an input. And uh, after calling it, we can also give the control of the end of the simulation to precise. So you see now in our while condition, we have is coupling ongoing. Then apart from only uh, Controlling the end of the simulation, we can also let precise control the time step. And this is because in uh, some times, the two solvers uh, may not be able to proceed as long as they want because a coupling time is approaching. Therefore, uh, we need to take the minimum of the time step that precise wants, wants uh, us to do and the time step size that the solver wants to do. So we need to be able to override the time step of the solver. And this is also returned at initialization. Now, we're not uh, completely there yet. Uh, first of all, we need to do the same things in the propagator. I would uh, like you to do this at home. And you can also um, find the solution in the repository, I will not tell you directly where to find it now. And 
let's see what's happening when we run it and how can we actually run it. So here I will use Tmux to split my terminal in two as it's very convenient uh, when we have two solvers at the same time. We are starting here the two solvers completely normally. There is nothing in the middle. There's no server or anything that we need to start. You see that uh, the generator starts, reports some information about precise, uh, finds the configuration file, and then it waits for the coupling partner to appear. Now, let's also start our coupling partner, partner with propagator. The moment it starts, we see that the simulation uh, starts. Notice that on the left side, the generator has essentially completed and waits for the propagator to also complete because remember that we have a one-way coupling. But still, even though we call the bumps, uh, nothing is happening. So uh, yes, the solvers uh, interacted, but they did not exchange any data. So did we forget anything? Yes, so apart from defining a mesh and defining vertices for this mesh, we actually need to associate data with these vertices and this mesh. Therefore, after we set the mesh vertices, we can also uh, get an ID for, for the data that we're exchanging with, uh, with a lot of imagination. In this example, we're calling data. And uh, we can now refer to it. And we can call, uh, for example, the method write block scalar data to write a bunch of data, a bunch of scalars to uh, of data ID to the vertex IDs. And what we write is the solution U. Then we also have uh, the advance and only then and not before that, this data will be sent to the other participant. If we had the bidirectional coupling, then we could also call similarly read block scalar data to read uh, values back. Apart from scalars, we can also exchange vectors and uh, there is also a way to exchange only one um, piece of data at a time. So now it should actually work. Let's, let's see what's happening. Now, we run the solvers the same way, but this time just for chains, let's start the propagator first. So the order does not matter at all. And um, the simulation starts. We see exactly the same picture as before. We wait until it finishes. And let's jump directly to the results. Now you see something more interesting. The propagator changes its boundary values, its boundary condition uh, every few time steps. Notice that we here, uh, for demonstration, we don't couple every time step. We also don't need to couple every time step, but we couple only every few time steps. Therefore, uh, this is also quite important. The two solvers can do completely different uh, time steps. We may have a fluid simulation that does very small time steps and a structure simulation that does very large time steps. And then we only couple every few uh, time steps of the one solver. Again, let me uh, state again here that this is the simplest case possible that we can imagine. So this is a unidirectional serial and explicit coupling with a nearest neighbor mapping where we actually even have uh, meshes of the same uh, number of nodes. Let me uh, clarify two terms here. So what I just now explained, we refer to as subcycling. So the one solver is doing multiple time, time steps, 
pair uh, coupling uh, time window of precise. And um, we also distinguish between explicit coupling, that is when the solvers interact only once, or implicit coupling in our terminology, that means that the solvers iterate uh, until they read convergence. In that case, we would also need to uh, re return the solver to a previous state, um, for example, uh, by storing and reloading a checkpoint. Now, I talked about many things that uh, are defined in a configuration file of precise. Let's uh, do a short attempt to look into this file. And I will start not by looking at the file, but by visualizing the file. Uh, since a few months, we have a very nice uh, config visualizer, a tool that uh, can parse uh, a precise config file and make a graph out of it. And here we can see that we have the two participants, the generator and the propagator, also declared by these polygons. And these two are coupled in a serial explicit uh, scheme with the first participant being the generator and the second participant being the propagator. They communicate through sockets. And let's now see the flow of data. The generator is writing something that is called data on its generator mesh that it defines. Therefore, we have it with a solid line. And um, the propagator reads this data from the propagator mesh. So how do we go from this generator mesh to this propagator mesh? We first exchange the generator mesh from the generator to the propagator. And then the propagator does a nearest neighbor mapping from the generator mesh to the propagator mesh. This is also uh, something that can uh, help the performance if we have uh, different number of uh, cores in the two sides and uh, the participant with the many cores can actually do the mapping in a smaller number of data. Then let's look at the exact file uh, which describes the same thing. First of all, we have here a 2D uh, solver interface. Then we are, we are only defining data as a scalar. And then we have uh, two meshes, the generator mesh and the propagator mesh. Both are using uh, the data that we defined above. And then we define the two participants. First, we define the generator, which uses the mesh, generator mesh, which actually it also provides. So it's the one defining it and uh, it writes data onto the generator mesh. There's no uh, mapping or anything else defined here, but if we look at the propagator, we see that uh, here we have, um, we read data from the propagator mesh and we actually map from the generator mesh to the propagator mesh and we do a consistent mapping. An alternative would be a conservative mapping. This is uh, reading from the generator mesh to the propagator mesh. And because we need both meshes here, we need to also use them above. Now, in the, uh, we can also define how they communicate. For example, here with sockets, an alternative would be with MPI. And uh, we also define the coupling scheme, which is now serial explicit. The first participant is the generator, the second is the propagator, and uh, we couple every 0 0.01 uh, seconds. The maximum time when the precise will say the simulation should now stop is 0 0.1. And uh, we also define that we exchange uh, the generator mesh carrying data from the generator to the propagator. Now uh, it's the time that uh, I can drink some water and I can ask Benjamin for any questions. Yes, there have already been a few questions in the chat. 
I'm trying to answering them. Um, please feel free to ask more. I guess so far we were pretty fast, so maybe uh, we left out some things. Otherwise, I think we are going, we're doing good, and I would hand back to Marquis. Okay, then I, I assume we can continue. We are kind of ahead of schedule, and this is okay because we will have a lot of this time for uh, proper discussion at the end. So let's now see how we can use uh, the open form adapter so that we don't have to program all these things in open form. We have done this uh, for you. It's a project uh, that is growing more and more and have contributions from many people. And uh, all these are not only for features, but also to make your lives easier. So what does this adapter do? First of all, it's a function object. Therefore, you don't need to, to change uh, any, any code inside your solver. It only needs to support function objects. And uh, the adapter uh, will then link to precise. It needs to be able to override boundary values of open foam with values it receives from the other solver through precise. And we define uh, precise buffers that we read and write from. And of course, it needs to do the opposite. It needs to be able to extract boundary values from open foam and pass them to the buffers of precise. Then, in implicit coupling, we need to redo some iterations. So when precise says so, the adapter should be able to get a complete um, checkpoint of open foam, including uh, time, and then uh, tell open form, okay, now you need to, to revert everything back to the previous state. Then, uh, in some times, uh, the two solvers need to synchronize. So if precise tells that uh, the maximum time step size is actually smaller than the one that open form wants to do, then the adapter should be able to adjust the time step size of precise of open foam. For this recipe, we will need precise version two, installed the same way, and a recent open foam version. So we try to support as many as possible. We currently support uh, all the latest versions of the ESI in the foundation. Uh, we unfortunately uh, cannot out of the box support foam extent uh, for technical reasons, but I would be very happy to accommodate uh, contributions and uh, we also need the precise open form adapter if you get the latest master it should work with all the esi versions and the foundation versions up to five uh, but in the next days uh, i'm going to merge a pull request that is going to treat everything uh, the same without you needing to do anything else you can find detailed instructions in the wiki of the adapter then how to build this? It's very simple and very automatic. We have an old WMake script, which uh, uh, simply calls WMake after defining a few environment variables. And uh, to help you find out what goes wrong, uh, if it goes, and the files that you need to send us if you want to uh, debug something would be the old WMake.log. So, the same screen output that all wmake uh, shows. wmake.log, the output of essentially make, and ldd.log, which checks if uh, the libraries can link at runtime. I'm not going to show you the details of how to build it. It's very simple. Simply click on this uh, when you access the slides. Now, let's look at the tutorial that is uh, distributed with the adapter. Most of our tutorials are uh, distributed separately. This is with the adapter. And this is a conjugate heat transfer scenario where we have a channel flow with buoyant pimple foam. And uh, below it, we have a heated plate 
uh, solve with Laplacian form. The, in the tunnel, we have an inlet of 300 Kelvin. And in the bottom of the plate, we have a higher temperature of 310 Kelvin. And of course, uh, in, as time passes, we should see that um, heat propagates from the bottom to, to the tunnel and we get this isothermal lines. Let's see what we need to configure to make this case run. Apart from uh, the tunnel flow with point beam foam and the plate with Laplacian foam, we need the open foam adapter, which is exactly the same in both cases, and precise, which is also exactly the same in both cases. For uh, its adapter, for, for, for the adapter, for its case, we will need a configuration file, which is now an open form dictionary. And uh, in the middle, we also have precise that has this XML file that contains all the coupling configuration for both participants. Note here that if you are uh, looking at older tutorials, this uh, open form adapter config uh, used to be a YAML file that this has recently changed. Now, let's look at uh, the case as we download it from, uh, as we get it from GitHub. Here we have uh, the usual open form files plus a few uh, helpful scripts to run or clean our files. We have a fluid case defined normally with um, initial conditions, boundary conditions, we have our constants and the system directory. In the system directory, we have an additional file called precise dict, which I will describe next. And we have a very similar situation in the solid. Apart from this, we also have the precise config.xml, which is uh, in the parent directory of the both of the two cases. Here we will mainly discuss, uh, or we mainly need to change the temperature configuration file to set uh, compatible boundary condition types that we can overwrite. We need to enable the adapter in the control dict. We need to uh, configure the adapter in the precise dict, and we need uh, to prepare the precise config XML. The case is already configured, and I will just show you the important bits. To enable the adapter, uh, we need to go in the control dict of both uh, cases and do exactly the same thing. This is why uh, it is cut on the right because it's essentially exactly the same file. So we need to go and uh, define a functions node to define a function object. We name it arbitrarily precise adapter and it is of type precise adapter function object, which we have already compi compiled, and it should be somewhere in our libraries, um, user libraries of open phone. Then uh, we say that for this function object, we need actually to link to this library. Now let's look at the configuration file of the adapter. This uh, is short and mainly needs to to say how uh, the adapter needs to interact with open foam. First of all, it uh, points to the precise config that we are using for our couple simulation, and then it defines the name of the participant. So we need to know that this is the fluid participant. It, would, it could be something completely different. This needs to be defined in the config. Then in the adapter, we have uh, different modules providing different uh, coupling data readers and writers. And one of them is conjugate heat transfer, the CHT module that can read and write temperature, heat flux, sink temperature, and heat, uh, heat transfer coefficient. Then we see that in the solid side, we do exactly the same. We point to the same configuration file. We have the solid participant and we again use the conjugate heat transfer module. Then we define an interface, a coupling interface in both um, participants. In the fluid participant, uh, we say that our interface 
our interface uses the fluid mesh of precise and associates it with the interface patch of OpenFOAM. Then on this patch, we want to read heat flux and we want to write temperature. We see the reverse situation in the solid where we read temperature and write heat flux. And we do this, of course, on the solid mesh. On the, again, uh, patch that is happened to, to be named interface. This can be completely arbitrary. And what this is, this is a completely normal uh, wall, uh, which we define in our block mesh stick. Nothing special here. Then, in the temperature file that we are coupling, we need to uh, define a compatible boundary condition for uh, this interface patch. Remember that in fluid, we are reading heat flux. This means that precise needs to set the gradient of the temperature. Therefore, we need to select that this is of type fixed gradient, otherwise um, we'll not be able to, to assign values to it. And then we give an arbitrary value which will be overwritten. Similarly, for the solid, remember that we are reading uh, temperature, so we need to set that this is a fixed value, and again we set an arbitrary uh, value. Let's look at the precise config XML, which uh, starts getting a bit more uh, real life. This time we have a 3D interface, and we have two data, the temperature and heat flux, and both are scalars. Then we have the two meshes, the fluid mesh and the solid mesh, and both use the same data. Let's then look at the fluid participant. We have here, again, uh, a mapping from the solid mesh to fluid mesh, and this is again consistent. And uh, we write temperature and we read heat flux. And of course, uh, we need to use both meshes in this participant to be able to map from the one to the other. Exactly the same situation in solid that also does a mapping to, to keep our simulation balanced. And then we go directly to the coupling scheme node. Here we see that we are using a serial implicit scheme. And this means that now that we have a bidirectional coupling, the solid uh, executes, then sends values to the fluid, and it waits. Then the fluid computes, passes values back to the solid, and waits. And then uh, if the values on the interface have not converged, which usually does not happen in the first time step, we execute this again by going back in time. So this is an implicit coupling. And because the two participants wait for each other, this is a serial coupling. We could also have a parallel explicit or parallel implicit uh, scheme where similar uh, to a Jacobi fashion, the two uh, solvers would just communicate once and then compute the same time step at the same time and then communicate again. Now, what do we have here? We have again the coupling window size and the maximum time step. Then we define the order of the participants. The first is the fluid and the second is the solid. And uh, we exchange temperature from fluid to solid over the fluid mesh and heat flux from solid to fluid over the solid mesh. Then we have um, to define some criteria for convergence. So we check the temperature on the fluid mesh and we want this to be less than 10 to the minus six. And we have a stopping criterion for uh, 200 iterations. So if this uh, is hit, we simply move on. 
However, this should not happen and especially should not happen later in the simulation as we are using the interface quasi-Newton acceleration method which can learn from the history of the simulation. How to, how to um, configure this would be a complete uh, separate discussion and maybe we can treat this in the uh, discussion round. Again, uh, this may look difficult, especially uh, if we are preparing it and we are trying to find a bug. So we can again visualize it using the same tool. It may look a bit spaghetti, but we can follow again the same uh, way. So fluid is writing temperature to the fluid mesh, which is exchanged and sent to the solid participant, which maps from the fluid mesh to the solid mesh and the reach temperature from there. Now, let's see uh, what happens if this uh, runs and how to actually run this. Let's see, this is what we have. Again, what I showed you in the files. And then we go to our fluid directory and we prepare our fluid simulation completely normally. And then it's important that we go back to the parent directory and we start the simulation from there, where the precise config is also. You will see uh, quite some output here. This is mostly debug output that you can switch off. And um, you can see that here we are running, for example, in one uh, processor. Then let's continue to uh, the solid solver, which we again prepare completely normally. And we can also uh, run it. So we can run Laplace and Foam again from the same directory so that the two solvers can find each other. And uh, normally, if you execute it locally, uh, you will get quite some output quite uh, frequently. And this appears uh, less frequent due to the recording. At the end of the simulation, um, we will also get some uh, performance data and uh, and you can also find uh, all the events and so on in files at precise uh, rights. Let's uh, now see the results. We have the two cases which we need to load in Paraview. So we load our case files and then we also load the solid case and then we can couple this to, we can group this two we can make a slice and if we have results we can visualize the temperature and see how this evolves let's also make a contour plot of temperature from 300 to 310 every one Kelvin and this is what we get and uh, here let me comment that if you're using the ESI version there is a, a incompatibility with their implementation of the function objects and you may get um, some uh, empty result directories, which you can simply remove with, with the script that we have there. This is a completely um, simple visualization issue. Then we have reached the end of level two. So this was now how to couple two open foam solvers. And we have seen how to configure uh, the open foam adapter and how to configure a more real life simulation for compute heat transfer. Now, I would like again to drink some water and ask Benjamin for questions. Hey, um, yes, questions are piling up, um, but questions are mainly about precise in general. 
So I'm not sure if it makes sense to, to raise them here for everyone. So they're not targeted so much for the, um, uh, the, the, the training, the tutorial that you just showed, but more general about features of precise. Okay, then, uh, this is Jonathan. then I will speed this up a bit so that we have more time for discussion at the end. And please collect uh, the, the questions that may affect most of the people. Is there anything regarding the configuration of Open Foam? Um, of Open Foam, no. There were some questions about the configuration of Precise, but also more in a general sense, not specific for the example here. Okay. Yeah. Then um, ma maybe one thing, um, if you ask questions, um, please ask in the public chat and don't send private messages. Um, also, Zoom does not handle private messages so well, so I always have to switch back between public and private. Please, please ask on the public chat. Also, feel free to, to ask, especially later, if we don't have time to discuss everything, please uh, ask on the conference application or uh, the best place if you have more elaborate questions would be at our precise forum on this course that I will show you at the end. But it looks like we have uh, more than enough time to complete the, um, the puzzle and see how can we actually couple open foam with a completely external solver that open foam has no idea about. Let's, uh, um, jump into it. We have uh, several tutorials that you can find on our website. Most of them are available on the tutorials repository. Uh, apart from the one that I just showed that for historical reasons is in the same repository as the open form adapter. And this is an overview of what we have. So we have Convicted transfer tutorials, FSI tutorials, uh, some coupled heat equation and structure structures coupling, and solvers you can uh, see are various open foam solvers. Uh, we have Calculix, we have Phoenix, Nutils, that is another finite element library, um, and PL2 as well as LG2. Now, we already discussed the first one the Borean pimple form Laplacian form uh, for our plate. Let's now go to uh, the FSI cases. I would like to discuss the uh, open form DL2 case that uh, you may be familiar with is a channel flow with a vertical perpendicular flap attached to the bottom with due to the flow, it starts bending. This will oscillate uh, for a few time steps until eventually it reaches some kind of steady state. You can find uh, detailed instructions for this in our wiki in this link, but uh, let's see how it would be if you, if you run it. For this recipe, we will need precise version two. There is a catch here, uh, you need to also have precise built with Petsy, but only if you want to run the case in parallel and with RBF mapping. And I will uh, explain both later. If you're using Ubuntu 2004, you can simply get the Ubuntu package that we have for uh, precise version two, it's built with Petsy. And uh, in in a later release, you will not even need Petsy to, to run this in parallel in a single node. Then uh, you need again open foam, a recent version, the latest open foam adapter. We will use DL2 9.2 and uh, the DL2 adapter that we have. If you don't know, uh, DL2 is similar to open foam in the sense that it provides uh, libraries and methods that you can use to build your own solver. 
it has some examples prepared and we have derived from one of these examples to make our own uh, nonlinear and our own nonlinear solid solver in DL2 that is a completely uh, toy solver to, to show how one could use it. And uh, our adapter is nothing more than, than such an example of solver. Then uh, let's configure again open foam. This time we need to configure not the temperature but the velocity of the flap. And this we need to set to a type moving wall velocity, again with an arbitrary value. And we need to uh, set again a boundary condition type for the point displacement as we are gonna read displacements from, from the other solver. And for the uh, mesh motion, we are using displacement Laplacian. To configure the open foam adapter, we have again this system precise dict. And what is different here, this time we are using the FSI module and we define two interfaces, uh, interface one and interface two. In interface one, we have a mesh defined on the face centers of the flap patch and it's called fluid mesh centers in precise. And there we want to write stresses and we don't need to read anything. The interface two is defined on the face nodes of the flap patch and we name it fluid mesh nodes. There we read the displacements but we don't write anything. Here we may also read some additional parameters. We have an incompressible solver so we read the reference uh, density. For the DL2 adapter, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. You can find everything in the DL2 adapter wiki, but I'm only going to say that we are going to use the linear elasticity solver. And uh, this uses a linear elasticity.trm configuration file that has several subsections and sections. And there we have a subsection for precise. Here you can again see that we have uh, the precise config XML. We have uh, that this participant is named solid and that we read stresses and try this paper. So the reverse. Let's now configure precise. I will skip to the interesting parts. So we have the fluid with um, reads, displacements and write stresses. But uh, this time we have a more interesting uh, second order mapping technique with radial basis functions, in particular thin, thin plate splines. And this is a read mapping from the solid mesh to the fluid mesh nodes. And it's a consistent mapping as we are um, uh, only mapping stresses and displacements here. We do the same for solid. And uh, just for the demonstration, I want to show you a nice feature. You can also define a watch point on, uh, the, on a precise mesh, which will plot you the, the values of the data that, that this mesh carries over time. Here we define this uh, watch point to be on the tip of the flap. Other features that you can use is also to, to export the complete meshes and see how the mapping works, but I'm not going to discuss it today. Then we are using again uh, interface quasi-Newton and let's see what's happening. We are now inside the tutorial uh, directory. We have the same tree. And uh, for the sake of presentation, I have reduced the time to 005. This is mostly for the recording as I cannot upload a larger file. Then uh, you see that
then you see that we have uh, a run fluid and the run solid script. And for example, the run the run solid uh, can um, simply take an option for the linear or the nonlinear solver and then normally call the linear or the nonlinear elasticity solver with the parameter file. It does nothing else. Let's also see the run fluid file, which prepares and runs the case normally. And if we pass the parallel flag, it can run the case in parallel. Uh, decomposing, running MPI run with MPI run and reconstructing it. Now, excuse me for the technicalities, let's let it run. You see again the, the run solid file. And you can simply run the fluid in parallel. We see here that it started with four processes. And we also run the linear elasticity solver. You see they normally communicate, they exchange data. And after a while and a few iterations per time step, they end. Now let's look uh, in some of the files that precise print, uh, exports. And this is, for example, the iterations that uh, the fluid takes. And we can see that it takes uh, more or less after a while three iterations of, of, it, of its own time set to complete. And uh, the solid also takes, after the first iteration, takes three times to complete. Then let's uh, also see the results in Paraview. We load again the fluid and the solid. Uh, unfortunately, the two solvers define a different, um, a different uh, define time in a different scheme. So we can load both cases, but we will not be able to, to see them uh, synchronized. If you know uh, a good trick for this, I would be very happy to find out. So we see that uh, the flap moves and notice here that we have a solid model. So you see a, a linear solid model. So you see this skewness of the flap. Uh, if you run the nonlinear uh, vari uh, variant, you should see a much better behavior. Finally, let's uh, try to plot the watch point that we define. We can do it in our favorite uh, plotting tool. A very simple choice would be GNU plot. And if you run the script, which is also provided with the case, you can see how the flap moves. And this is a, a very helpful tool for validating uh, your results. Then uh, we, we also have uh, a recording of how the same case would be with open format calculix, uh, but it would again going through the same case and seeing more or less the same thing. So you can watch it at home or around the tutorial. Uh, now I will uh, go also to the to the tail of the presentation, and we will have all the questions later. When you want to start, you will probably go to our website. Of course, this is not as uh, often updated as our uh, GitHub where we do all the daily development, but it has uh, all the information that you need to get started. So mainly you can go to the resources to see what I will show you now. You can go to testimonials to see what other people are doing with Precise. You can go to publications to see uh, recent things we did and you can find more about the history of Precise and who we are. All the documentation is currently in 
uh, our on our GitHub wiki. Uh, this has been very nice until now because we can easily edit it. And as now the content uh, has grown quite a lot, we plan to merge this with our website and make the website uh, the main portal that you, you will need. You can find here uh, different ways to get precise. For example, you can find how to get precise with PAC if you want to install it on a, on a supercomputer that may have uh, limited dependencies already available. You can find packages for Ubuntu or for Arch and so on. You can find all the tutorials. You can find uh, the configuration options for uh, all the things that I showed you in the precise config. And you can find some uh, literature guide um, if, you, if you click on this link, if you want to learn more and uh, all of our tutorials. Then uh, eventually you will have questions. Uh, we can discuss many of them now, but you may have, first of all, the question is precise for me. So uh, then you can simply go to this, to this uh, category in our precise forum on this course, and you can ask a question there. If you have uh, questions on how to use precise or anything, you can also do it there. This exists for uh, like nine months now, and it's already quite active. So we would also like, after you start using Precise a lot, to also try to contribute uh, with answering questions. We would really need this. Then if you want uh, to ask something quicker, you can find us where we also daily uh, communicate for all of our development needs. This is on Gitter and uh, we have a, a room that you can ask any question, the, the lobby, but please, uh, if something is, uh, could be helpful for future readers, please keep it on the forum. Then since uh, February and our first precise workshop, we have uh, now more active YouTube channel where you can find the recordings from the talks you will hopefully be able to find this talk later uh, there, as well as uh, different talks. For example, uh, my talk in last year's FOSDEM uh, or uh, other uh, videos of users that have used Precise. If you also upload results, we would be very happy to, to link to your video. If you're using Twitter, that I think uh, the Open Phone community uses quite a lot, you can follow us. And uh, if you prefer the more traditional way, there is also a mailing list that uh, is not very spammy. So you could expect one email per month or so about uh, news of Precise. Finally, I would uh, really like to, to invite you and hopefully to meet you in person uh, in our second Precise workshop, which this time will be at the University of Stuttgart in Germany and 99% sure that it is going to be in February 22 to 25 and you can meet uh, me Benjamin and hopefully many of the people that came to our first workshop in February. This uh, contributes the, the presentation which was mixed with the implementation part. I would like to thank you very much for being here and uh, let me tell you that here uh, it was only me and Benjamin, but there are many, many people that have contributed a lot. For the OpenFOAM adapter, I also need to, to thank Lucia uh, Tsung, Derek Riseu, uh, David Schneider, Julian Seufert, and many more people. And uh, please feel free to start a discussion on our forum and uh, you can get this presentation from GitHub. So thank you very much. And I would like now to open uh, the stage for, for questions about the training and more general about Precise. And maybe um, Benjamin can, can start with the moderation. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm very happy about all the questions that you ask in the chat. I I did not manage to listen to your talk much, like this. <laughs> I had to answer all the questions. Um, maybe two things are uh, interesting for a broader audience, so I, I want to pick them up. And then we can also, of course, answer two more questions. Um, the first one was many people were interested in how this works on a cluster. Um, do you want to answer, Marcus? So can, can you make the discussion more concrete or should I go the direction that can cover probably most? Yeah, so how would you start a coupled simulation on a cluster? And can you use different number of processors and things like this? Yes. So, um, first of all, let's start from the communication. Let me tell you a technicality here. I told you that you need to start both simulations from the same directory. This is because uh, on this directory, only on the initialization phase, you will see a, a small file or actually now for performance reasons, a series of directories being written, which contain uh, only a small piece of information. And this is uh, the IP address of the other process of the other participant. This means that uh, you can essentially run the two participants in any two systems that can communicate through the network or through the same MPI communicator. You can uh, have the different ranks of the participants, the one running on a cluster and the other running on a workstation if, if the cluster allows this. You can have the uh, the two participants starting in two different uh, Docker containers that are uh, apart from anything else isolated. This we use for our um, system tests where we would check all of our tutorials with every commit. Uh, then uh, on the technicalities how to start it, we actually have in our uh, wiki, we have examples on how to start uh, the um, uh, how to start a parallel simulation in several clusters and supercomputers we are working with. For example, a super MOOC in G uh, here in, in Munich in Garking. And you can copy from that. Uh, you can, of course, start everything in the same node. Um, just execute the script where you start the one participant and you keep it in the background and then you start the other. Or you can have a more um, elaborate job script. Yes, and maybe to add, so when you, um, uh, normally you would write one job script for your scheduler and in there you would, um, well, let's say you have three nodes and then you would start the first solver on the first two nodes and the third, sol the second solver on the third node. Um, how to do this, of course, this depends on your supercomputer, so how to pin um, those processes. Um, but then the first, the adapter is a library, right? So then your two solvers first call the adapter. So here the open form adapter. And then the open form adapter calls precise, which again is a library. So you don't need to worry about um, on which processes precise runs, right? Precise runs on the same processes, same ranks that your solver also runs on. It's just a, a library that you call. Exactly. So, uh... Also, if you can go uh, further from one node, this depends on your solver. OpenFOAM can, so the couple simulation also will be able to. Yes, um, so there are uh, a few more questions that we, I think I wanna pick up. Um, let, I, I start with the last one because it fits a bit better here. Um, what is the um, coupling overhead when running in parallel? Um, yeah, so we, we have tested this a lot. So this was one of the um, most important directions of development in the, the last five years was to make precise fast. Um, so I would say in general, um, that coupling should, should be much cheaper than whatever your solver does so that you should not feel it. Also not when you try to scale up. 
So we also had this running for 10,000s of MPI ranks and there's still the, the coupling was not very visible. Um, of course, when you do this implicit coupling, so when you sub-iterate, you have to redo a time step multiple times for a solver, right? So this makes the couple problem more expensive than the single physics problem. Um, I hope that I answered this question, Kenny. Um, maybe then let's pick up the, the, the second last one. So um, uh, Joel was asking about, um, can you explain a little bit more um, the XML file, for instance, for the level two case? I think we still have time so we could back, go back there. And uh, John just asked, is the coupling peer-to-peer? -peer? Uh, yes, it is. So it's, it's fully parallel and peer-to-peer. -peer. So is there some, some specific thing we should uh, discuss uh, about the config file? So maybe you can start this time from the visualization. Maybe this makes things easier. Or should we look deeper into the details? Yes, Chell, if you, if you wanna give um, more details, if not, I would say just the, the big picture again. Yeah, he says yet, yes, that is okay. Meaning, I guess the visualization. Okay, then let's, let's take it from here. We have two participants. By the way, we can also uh, have three participants, if this makes things easier, which I don't think so. And we have here fluid and solid. Also the rectangles. So we have uh, the two participants communicating via the network, by sockets. And we also have a coupling scheme that is serial, implicit, with the first being the fluid and the second being the solid. Then we have the solid. Um, so the first is the fluid. So let's start from the fluid. What does the fluid do? It writes temperature to the fluid mesh, which it provides. Then it exchanges, it sends a copy of the mesh to the solid. And in a parallel case, it will only send uh, what the other process actually needs. So it gets a copy of the fluid mesh, and then it does a nearest neighbor, could be nearest projection, could be RBF, to map from the fluid mesh to the solid mesh. And then from that mesh, it reads the temperature. And we need the mapping because they can be in different locations, different nodes, and so on. They don't even need to be uh, fitting. Then, uh, after it reads temperature, it solves. The fluid is still waiting, and then it writes heat flux to the solid mesh, which is then sent to the fluid. And the fluid then has all the information to do a nearest neighbor mapping from the solid mesh to the fluid mesh and read the heat flux again. Other than that, maybe we could go to, to specific details. Okay. Um, I, I would say, Chal, if you have, yeah. Yes, he says, I guess I can get more um, on the documentation. Yes, so uh, on GitHub, uh, precise, then you go to the wiki and there's a complete section that gives a broad overview of the um, configuration. Um, I'll post a link in a minute. Yes. And um, if we finish there, with the slides, I could also uh, show a few of these things. Uh, let's let's collect them, and I can show them later. Yeah. Uh, let's um, first pick up another question by Brent. Um, he was asking what are um, advantages um, and concerning also performance of sockets versus MPI communication. Um, maybe should yes, I take so, this or? Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, take it. 
Yeah, I think there, there are two sides to this. So the first one is performance. Um, we have seen that MPI can be faster than our TCP IP implementation. Um, but this depends on the MPI implementation. And this is um, really minimal. So you will only feel this if you do very large simulations. Um, I would say for normal cases, you don't feel any difference performance wise. And the other side to this is that, um, uh, yeah, we have seen that uh, TCP IP sockets are just much more robust um, on various systems, uh, robust in terms of um, building. Um, so that's why we typically recommend to use TCP IP sockets because normally they just work out of the box. And with MPI, um, while we use very specific um, features of MPI, um, so we need these ports in MPI and that those are not always very well implemented depending on the MPI implementation. So we have seen already many problems there on different clusters. Um, yeah, bottom line um, sockets because they're more robust and they're not much slower. Also, let me uh, briefly mention that uh, one of our really main focus is to make Precise more usable and more, more user-friendly and to, uh, to build a community. So we try to give good defaults that work on a laptop and so on. We know that if you are experienced enough to try to squeeze the performance, you will look for the more advanced settings, but it should of course work out of the box. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a, um, another question. Uh, interesting training, thank you. We run 120 million cell external aerodynamics runs and would like to do an FSI coupling to predict deformation of plastic parts. Do you think this is achievable with precise? So 120 million cells um, in the fluid code, I guess. And then you have uh, uh, another solid solver. Um, uh, I would say this is the perfect use case for precise, yes. Um, so it should not be too big. We, we had similar large cases. Um, so your fluid solver here is open foam or? Okay, 120 million um, elements. Um, I th okay, so uh, elements I think should still work. Of course, depends on what numerical scheme you then use and how many degrees of freedom this is. Okay, he says open foam. Um, yes. If open foam scales, then uh, precise should not really be the problem because we are only exchanging uh, a small set of the domain. We are only exchanging parts of the interface uh, and we are doing it peer to peer. Mm -hmm. And um, he's saying probably linked with LS Dyna. Um, so there were already users before that coupled to LS Dyna. There is not really an adapter for LS Dyna but there is already um, a brief documentation online on how to couple with LS Dyna that you could start from. And of course, if you want to build up on this, it would be very nice to, to contribute it. Until now, yes. we mostly did not have this for uh, difficulties with, with the license compatibility. Not of precise, but of uh, LS Dyna. Yeah. And the was a company who did this adapter and they were not uh, allowed to, to share the code, but they were allowed to, sh to share the documentation. Precise is uh, LGPL, meaning that you can link to it even from commercial solvers. Uh, but other than that, it's completely normal GPL. OK. 
Okay, I don't see any current question here. It could be that I just overlooked any question before. Um, if that's the case, please um, just uh, ask again. Otherwise, we could make use of the time and maybe stepping to, to GitHub and showing the documentation. Yes, so uh, for this, let's let's find this i'm not on my browser so if you go to resources or if you click directly on the site you get to github and you get to precise this is the the main repository that is also pinned here then, uh, if you go to, to Wiki, which you can also find directly from the resources, uh, you have several things here. So we have um, a link, for example, to an older uh, reference paper we have. We are uh, in the process of updating this. We have a literature guide for the different features and uh, also a roadmap of things that are probably coming up in the near future. Then you can find uh, all the ways we have to to get precise. And here you can see with the stars what usually works or people have experience with. Then we have uh, the different tutorials, which you can also find on the, on the website. Uh, then we have the different configuration. For, so for example, um, let's, uh, let's open the um, uh, acceleration uh, configuration, which is uh, usually more complicated. So we have different acceleration techniques. We have constant under relaxation, we have ITCAN under relaxation, and we have, of course, the interface quasi Newton with uh, different variants, different filters. Um, so you can see here uh, some example and uh, something that is uh, even more helpful. If you go back, you can find um, something that we should probably uh, link somewhere, the XML reference, which you can generate also locally as a markdown file, for example, like this. And then you can get detailed instructions on what are the possible options for um, for every part of the configuration. Uh, the page is quite huge. I hope it renders uh, in your browser. Otherwise you can produce it and see it locally. Uh, what else can we see here? We have um, some additional tools. For example, this um, um, visualizer that uh, I mentioned which is which is in a in a different repository inside precise we also have um, some common troubleshooting instructions and we have uh, the most useful thing uh, for people that want to write their own adapter which is an adapter example here you can find detailed explanations of all the steps I presented in level one. And um, if you want to find uh, an API documentation similar to the one uh, OpenFoam has, we have a Doxygen guide. We have some dummy solvers that we are mainly using to, to test if the installation is correct and so on. We have um, more details 
regarding the non-C++ APIs, for example, for Fortran, for Python, for MATLAB, and how they are connected together. At the moment, the documentation is, of course, a bit um, mixed between uh, user and developer documentation, and we plan to design this better in the near future. Then, if you have already used Precise in the past, uh, and you may have heard the news that we have a new version, there is an upgrade, an upgrade guide for going from Precise 1 to 2. Uh, you need to change very few things in the um, configuration, and we have uh, an unwritten promise that uh, we will have major versions only very uh, few years, every few years, for example, two or three, so that you can focus on, on coupling and not um, keeping up with our updates. Uh, other than that, the project is very actively developed in Munich, in Stuttgart, and with Benjamin Neinhofen. And uh, we plan uh, a next feature release, most probably for, for July. Then, um, we well, also have some uh, theory, and then Benjamin, what? Yeah, maybe you can quickly show this, this course again. Yes. Just, yeah, so um, this is probably... Can I go the, to uh, resources? I can go to this course. And um, you can find, for example, uh, a user that is currently trying to make his uh, couple amidine and open form simulation converge. This is uh, a thread. And you can use different tags and so on. Let's see what other resources we have. We have uh, the chat room. Uh, we also have a few things on the research gate, but we don't update it so often. Here are a few of the main tutorials. And um, in the couple of codes, you can find the not always completely up to date list of what we currently um, support out of the box. Um, some frequently asked questions also on this course. You, you may be interested to particularly look into this. For example, can precise be used for volume coupling? Yes, it was not uh, designed for this. It was mainly designed for surface coupling, but there is nothing stopping uh, you from doing it. And a few users have already successfully tried it. Then, um, we have uh, testimonials. So if you, if you do a nice simulation uh, with Precise, we would be very, very happy to, if you contacted us and we add your story here, some uh, selected publication, the story of Precise, which starts essentially uh, in the early 2000s. And then the, the current development team, uh, other contributors, and yeah. uh, the previous workshop page. Marcus, there's a, another question in the chat. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when do you think the Elmer adapter will be available? So I already answered before that um, this is on our roadmap. Um, yeah, this is a bit hard to say. So we are, um, uh, we have not yet started with the Elmer adapter development, but this is something we want to do. So this, this is definitely not something that will be ready in two months, but will take a little bit longer. But of course we are very open here for any contributions, right? So if uh, you are interested in coupling Elmer, we are also there to help you developing it. Um, yeah, uh, so far we just noticed that um, we get contacted a lot about Elmer and we decided, okay, this will be an important strategic goal to have an adapter for Elmer. Yeah. Okay. 
Finally, let me um, yes. click again on uh, the link of the slides. I actually just showed the slides from here. So you already have the state that I uploaded. I will try to also contribute a PDF to the proceedings, um, but this may take some time to make the interactive parts uh, in a static way. Yes, I think the time is up. Yeah, and I'll say the, uh, the slides um, to contribute, even just a link to the slides here that we could put mm -hmm. on the proceedings website would be great. So we can just link to that if the presentation is better hosted somewhere else. So again, I, I really want to thank both of you for this really excellent training session. This is very, very informative. So I'm glad to see all the people who participated, all the great questions. It's really great when the training is interactive and we kind of lose that a little bit when we're not all in the same room, but I think here we really saw everybody actively participating. So um, that was really great. But uh, we will reconvene and in about 14 minutes with our uh, final technical sessions of the day and um, use that to close out the third day of the workshop. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you to our trainers and we'll see you all shortly in the next sessions. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure thank being you. here. Thank you. Bye now. Ciao. Bye bye. Have a good day. <laughs>